Well, hello and welcome to this live webinar. I'm Peter Switzer. Today we're talking about where investors can find income in the current low rate environment. To talk about what we, this actually means, I'm joined by Ying Yi and Cheng of Coolabar Capital. Coolabar is a leading active credit manager who manages over $5 billion worth of assets on behalf of their institutional and retail investors. Also on the line is Tom Hickey from Contango Asset Management to answer any specific question you might have on the Switzer High Yield Fund. Thank you both for joining us. Now, before we go any further, I would just say that this is a live and interactive webinar. So please submit any questions that you have and we'll aim to get them uh, and answered for you by the end of the session. You can enter a question by clicking the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. If you'd like uh, someone from the team to give you a call after the session, please also let us know via the Q&A section and we will be in touch. I'm excited to say that Coolabar has recently been appointed as the manager of the Switzer Higher Yield Fund, which has relaunched as a quoted vehicle and is currently traded on the Chai X exchange. Now, quoted vehicle basically means you can get it on the stock market and it's kind of like an ETF. So let's start with some key questions with you, uh, Ying Yi. Before we go, into the new fund itself. Can you just tell us what you guys think is going to be the outlook for the Aussie economy in 2021? Look, um, firstly, thanks for having me on, Peter. And yeah, I mean, we're very, we're quite bullish on growth. Um, we've seen, you know, a ton of fiscal stimulus and monetary stimulus continues to be rolled out. So as you would know, the RBA cut rates down to 0.1% over the course of last year. They also announced QE, um, so in November, they announced that they would be buying $100 billion of Commonwealth and state government bonds. And in February, before the current uh, you know, QE program ends, they announced a second round of QE um, starting after April. So, you know, and our view is that they'll continue rolling out this QE because they really need to meet these inflation and employment objectives. Meanwhile, you know, you can see that, um, you know, GDP is picking back up as well. And as the economy is sort of normalised, particularly with, you um, you know, the vaccine rollout, but also just because Australia's had COVID-19 under control, um, you know, we'll see that economic activity really pick up and, you know, people start spending again. I think people listening to us, you know, have heard plenty about QE or quantitative easing. Just in a nutshell, uh, Ying Yi, what does quantitative easing mean? What does the Reserve Bank doing and what's its impact, particularly on interest rates? Because that's my next question. Yeah, so look, the RBA has been forced to do QE or quantitative easing because they've taken rates to what they consider to be the terminal cash rate, which, which is 0.1%. So while offshore central banks have moved to negative rates, the RBA or the Reserve Bank of Australia has been quite adamant about not moving to negative rates, um, which kind of leaves them out of you know, other policy options. What they can do, though, is they can actually purchase, you know, securities in the market. Um, what sort of securities or assets? Well, you know, we've seen offshore, um, there's been a plethora of, you know, different types of securities. But the most obvious one would be uh, to buy government bonds. Why government bonds? Well, firstly, with the private sector a bit impaired, so business spending is not necessarily sort of increasing, you know, businesses aren't yeah, embarking on massive capex plans at the moment, right? There's still a bit of uncertainty left. It's kind of the role of the government, therefore, to be boosting the economy. Um, however, they need to find that money from somewhere. And in order to do so, they need to issue more debt. Um, and so the RBA is, you know, indirectly supporting that government debt that needs to be issued because they become a very large marginal buyer of this government debt or these government bonds. And when they buy those bonds, basically, it means money is left in the economy 
and that really helps the economy and it also keeps interest rates down. Well, it keeps interest rates down, but it keeps the cost of borrowing down yeah. for the government, right, which is incredibly important. There's no point, you know, for the government who has to issue, you know, at very high rates of debt because they're being forced to, right? If you have the central bank supporting them and being that large buyer, that keeps the cost of borrowing down and it keeps, yes, those um, expectations around interest rates anchored as well. Let's go to interest rates. What's uh, Coolabar's outlook for interest rates and asset prices in the year ahead? Well, I mean, look, we we actually think, well, we think that the RBA definitely isn't in any sort of a hurry um, to hike rates. They've currently still got yield curve control, um, which means that they're keeping um, rates out uh, out from zero to three years around 0.1%. So yield curve control, they have been buying bonds out to the three year mark, um, trying to keep that cost of borrowing down. And that's really, again, to drive expectations um, around the fact that rates will be low for longer. So we ascribe to the view. Um, that's not to say, obviously, you know, Pete and you and I, we've spoken about inflation in the future, but that's not something that is in the immediate sort of horizon. Um, and in fact, you know, we're of the view that they're going to announce QE3, mm -hmm. um, you know, when before the QE2 program ends. Now, the QE2 program hasn't even started yet, but um, there's no reason why they wouldn't announce another 100 billion. And 100 billion is, um, you know, a bit of an arbitrary sort of a number. We think that the RBA will be looking to sort of recalibrate that. Um, so it could be even more. Yeah. And so in a sense, what the RBA is saying to the bond market, that that's the private aspect of the bond market, is that don't mess with us. If you're trying to push rates up, we're going to take you on. Well, yeah, pretty much. They want to keep the cost of borrowing down. You know, that's not to say, look, obviously there's been a lot of market forces pushing rates higher as people have been factoring in inflation. But, you know, the RBA is not alone in trying to fight this, right? Other central banks are doing this as well. And we need to do the same. Yeah. So for our uh, viewers, the implication then is that uh, interest rates on bank deposits are really going to be low for a long time. That's right. So look, um, the RBA has, you know, obviously lowered rates. Um, even the banks uh, that have deposits with the RBA, these are called ES balances, they cut that rate to 0%. So even the banks um, earn 0% on deposits left with the RBA. So they want to encourage activity. They want to encourage people to go out and spend it. Okay. So what, yeah, you guys play in the bond market. You know, the fund that you manage for us is all about you playing the bond market as well as you can. So all, all of what you've said so far, what's the outlook therefore for the bond market for you guys? Well, I think it really it's very important to distinguish um, within the bond market. So firstly, um, there are fixed rate bonds and there are floating rate bonds. Um, you you know, a lot of the um, listeners and the participants in this webinar may have read recently that there's been an absolute bloodbath in the bond market. Um, and that has been true, but that's only the case for fixed rate bonds. So what this means is that, for example, when you buy a fixed rate bond, it's almost like a uh, fixing your mortgage or fixing your term deposit, for example. Mm. Um, you know, you might think, okay, if I fix my mortgage at, uh, let's just say 2% out to three years, um, if rates continue to, if rates rise, then you'll benefit because you fixed it at a low rate. Um, but if rates fall, then you kind of lose out because you could have fixed it at a lower rate. But instead you have to think about it as a bond holder, you're actually the lender now so as rates move higher you've actually missed out on lending to someone at a higher rate because you fixed it at a lower rate um, and so all of the shenanigans that have been taking place in february um, with the bond market route um, that's really been around fixed rate bonds because with all of the stimulus, um, and in particular, this has been led by the US as well. You know, obviously, um, US President Biden has announced, uh, you know, 
a mammoth stimulus package. Obviously, he needs to get all of this through the Senate, etc. However, all of the stimulus that's going in, whether it's fiscal policy, monetary policy globally, this is highly reflationary. This will create inflation down the track. So what we've seen is fixed rate bonds um, out to 10 years really push, being pushed, well, their yields have been pushed higher and therefore the prices have gone down. So notwithstanding the fact that central banks have tried to keep, you know, um, short end or short term rates, so out to three years, very anchored, that long end has been pushed very higher. So if I give you an example, the 10 year Aussie government bond yield was about 0.7% last year. Yeah, crazy. In February, it got to 1.95%. Mm. It's currently around 1.7%. Mm. So that moves very aggressively. And by the way, not much has happened, but this the market always moves ahead. And that's caused a lot of havoc for fixed rate portfolios or portfolios that have like have interest rate duration. That's a distinction. Um, the portfolios that we run and the Switzer High Yield Fund is a zero interest rate duration portfolio. So there is no interest rate risk in that portfolio at all. So if interest rates move higher and yields move higher, then that actually benefits us because we're floating rate. The coupons that we're generating from the bonds actually move higher as rates move higher. If rates move lower, we don't get that tailwind though. Um, so, you know, even though, so a lot of, uh, a popular fixed income benchmark for a lot of portfolios is the Osborne Composite Bond Index. In February, that was down 3.6%. Okay. Um, and that was the worst month that it had in 31 years. Mm. Um, and I can tell you the Switzer high yield portfolio in the month of um, February was actually up 0.29%. Uh, so, you know, yeah, well, in a month where equities and fixed rate bonds mm. were down. We were really roused on you if it was the other way around. Uh, you, you. <laughs> okay, well done, well done. So, it, it, what do you think? I think you've covered a lot of it, but do you think there's anything else that someone needs to, to know to understand, if you like, fixed income 101? Yeah. So um, on that note, I might just have a, just share my screen. Yeah. Um, and I'm going to share with you this in particular. You guys can see this, Peter, as my mouse hovers over. I'm putting my glasses on to see what I'm <laughs> The Switzer High Yield Fund. Okay. Yeah. And you can see as I scroll down. Now, there's something in the way. I think we yeah, there it is. It's a nice looking little chart. Okay, that. great. Yep. So you can see this. Okay, cool. So, okay, a bit of a fixed income 101. Um, there's, like with any asset class, Typically, if you want more returns, managers um, in fixed income will give you more risk. And fixed income has traditionally been a more institutional market. It's a wholesale market. Um, so there's minimum um, investment sizes. It's not like as if you could go on, you know, into your brokerage account and then access and buy bonds like you would with equities. Um, it's just not the case. Uh, most of the, like most of the securities that are traded other than um, hybrids that are within the portfolio within the Switzer higher yield portfolio, um, they're all traded OTC, over the counter. Um, now, just taking a step back, um, but as I said, as with any asset class, if you want more return, people generally chase more risk. Um, and in fixed income, the typical ways to drive more return would be what we call these types of risks, these beta risks. Um, and I'm already mentioned interest rate duration. Mm -hmm. So that's fixed rate risk. Um, so to take on more fixed rate risk to drive more return, you can invest in longer dated fixed rate bonds. So, you know, if you have a naturally upward sloping yield curve, you would know that a 15 year 
bond should pay you a higher rate of return than a 10-year bond, right? Yeah. Um, or we might see managers punting around on, you know, um, where interest rates are going to be. So they might, what we call, go underweight or overweight duration, but they're just punting around on interest rate futures. Um, the problem with that is that this is a very volatile market. Um, and it's actually the largest source of volatility for fixed income portfolios. However, mm. it's a way to drive more return. Um, so as rates move lower, then, you know, this will benefit. If rates move higher, this will sell off, which is what we saw last month in February. Yeah. The other way to drive more return would be to take on more credit risk. So investing in uh, high yield bonds, which is means more specifically sub investment grade. So double B, B, triple C rated securities or yeah. even unrated securities. Yeah, so what you're saying there is if, if government got bonds are the safest and the best, yeah. if you move into, say, corporate bonds, they're not as safe. And if you go into more, more risky companies, well, they're even more riskier and therefore yeah. they're, they're, they're sub-investment grade. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, for example, Virgin um, was a double B plus rated airline. Yeah. Um, obviously, we know what happened with Virgin. Uh, so, yeah. So, you know, you're you're taking on more credit default, like credit default risk yeah. in order to drive return. And very um, closely correlated with credit risk is illiquidity risk. So investing illiquid loans, illiquid corporate bonds and other illiquid securities. Mm. Um, the problem with this is that it conceals a lot of risk. So when you invest in an illiquid um, security, you might not know about anything going wrong until it actually blows up. So let me give you an example. Um, this week we've seen green sill in the news. I don't know whether Peter, you've um, seen this, but it was yeah. on the front page of the AFR yesterday, obviously, but it's been front and center. Yeah. So green sill is a, um, is a financier. Um, they issue illiquid loan products, um, which That's are high returns, I guess. Yeah, high returns, um, but they're illiquid loans. And anyway, Credit Suisse had to freeze or gate $10 billion of its funds uh, this week um, because these funds had invested in these green seal loans. So, you know, it's like we never heard about this and then it blows up and we hear about it. Mm. So these are the building blocks um, that, you know, fixed income managers can use to drive more return. But again, um, they come with risk. Uh, however, what we're trying to do is very different. Um, and so what Coolabar is trying to do and also, you know, within the Switzer High Yield Fund is we're trying to drive returns not through any of these beta sort of risks. So we run a zero interest rate duration portfolio. So the Switzer High Yield Fund is a zero interest rate duration portfolio. It has um, a high average credit rating, typically of between triple B to A. It's currently A. And it has also daily liquidity in the sense that you can buy and sell this on an exchange even within the day, if you like. You could buy it in the morning, sell it in the afternoon, I, I suppose, um, if you wanted to do that. So it's highly liquid. And, you know, at Coolabar, we drive returns through a different source. We drive returns through alpha, not beta. How do we find this alpha or this excess return? Well, we do it by finding capital gains. How do we find capital gains in our asset class? We do this by finding mispriced bonds. Um, what is a mispriced bond? Well, it's a bond that is paying too much interest after you adjust for its risk factors. So let's just say, um, you know, some of the risk factors, we're adjusting on average, you know, for at least 20 to 30, um, but we're adjusting for risk factors, which could include, you know, the credit rating of that bond, the liquidity of that bond, um, you know, the term to maturity of that bond, 
Um, where does it sit in the capital structure, the liquidity? I'm sure I said the liquidity, the industry of the issuer. You know, is it a bank? Is it a supermarket? Is it an airline? Um, and if that interest rate is higher than where we see fair value, i.e. it's mispriced, then as that traded interest rate then drops towards where our fair value or our predicted um, interest rate should be, so it drop, that yield then drops, then we get price appreciation in the bond because there's an inverse relationship between yield and price. Yeah. Um, and then we, we're able to sell that bond after we get that price appreciation for a capital gain. So at Coolabar, we're much like your active equities manager, but in fixed income. And, you know, Pete, I haven't even mentioned this yet. Um, this is why we're very different to a lot of our peers. So if I just zoom in one level, um, you'll see. And what's evident here is that we have a very large team. So Coolabar itself is actually running 5.7 billion um, in funds under management. Assets under management is about 8 billion. Um, and obviously within our farm is the Switzer High Yield Fund. But it is the same team across all 27 portfolios that we're running. Um, and, you know, you can see that we have 26 full-time execs. We're actually in the process of hiring an additional two more execs. Um, and we're continuously growing the team. Uh, a lot of our peers tend to have, might have two or three portfolio managers or one or two analysts. Um, at Coolabar, our investment team is made up of five portfolio managers and 13 analysts. Um, and you can see, you know, we've got a data science team in addition to your more traditional credit research analysts. But the reason why we have such a large team why we're running also 30 to 40 different quantitative valuation models and doing an intense amount of due diligence is because in order to find these capital gains or alpha, you need a very large team to do that. So we're also typically trading at least 70 times a day and on average $150 million a day. Okay. So you know, just before we go to some questions we've got here that have been sent in, so let's, let me let me just sum up basically what the Switzer High Yield Fund is. So it can be accessed via the exchange using the ticker code SHYF. It's listed on the Chinex exchange and you can easily access it via your share trading account, either online or physically with a stockbroker. The fund manager is Chris Joy's Coolbar Capital, as we already pointed out, and is supervised by what I think is a, a really smart Ying Yi and Cheng, who, are, who are, I've just been talking to. The fund invests in government bonds, including state issue ones, hybrids, top quality corporate bonds. The goal is to get returns of 1.5% to 3% over the RBA's cash rate, which is 0.1%. And the fund could do better or worse, but Coolabar has an above average return history. That's why I'm happy to work with the guys. The fund aims to provide investors with quarterly income, which is paid quarterly. And this is not a government guaranteed deposit, but currently term deposits are paying around 0.5% for uh, lock, locking up your money for a year. And because this is listed on the stock market, you can get in and out whenever you please, as uh, Ying Yi pointed out. So let's go to the questions that we've got here. Uh, so here we go. I'm being helpful with the questions. Here they are. So you've written in your recent portfolio update about bond spreads. Can you explain what that means? Yeah, sure. Um, so the bond spread is where it is traded at. So um, the way that obviously when you look at equities, um, they're traded at a price level. Um, but for bonds, you could have, you know, different tenor sort of bonds. Um, you could have different tenor as in different maturities. Some could be below par, above par. So the standard um, when trading bonds is actually to look at the interest rate. Um, and the interest rate is made up of the benchmark plus that bond spread. Um, and that benchmark tends to be BBSW, the bank bill swap rate. Um, so, you know, senior bonds, subordinated bonds and hybrids trade at a credit spread or a bond spread over that BBSW. Okay, let's go to the next one. What are the risks of investing in a fund like this? 
Well, the risk of investing in, I mean, there's always risk to investing in anything other than cash, but I can tell you that, um, so for anything, you know, under 250,000 within a bank deposit, that's government guarantee. So that's as good as it gets, it's AAA. Um, even when you invest in government bonds that are AAA rated, by the way, um, those have market risk because they're traded. Um, so they will have what we call mark to market volatility. So because all of the products, um, well, all of the assets that we're trading within this portfolio, other than obviously the cash that we hold, are traded securities, they have market risk attached to them. But as you can see, the average credit rating is quite high. It's investment grade. Um, currently, it's A. You have very little liquidity risk because the underlying securities that we're trading are super liquid. Obviously, these vary in terms of liquidity, but we're talking about a very liquid portfolio as well. Um, and there's no interest rate duration risk, as I mentioned. So all I would say is that there is market risk um, and there's volatility in the market. But on the whole, we're talking about a very safe portfolio. Okay, I just hang on a second. A question's come in here. How does that market risk, say, compare to something like an equities portfolio? That's a good question. Yeah, it's, um, it's substantially lower volatility um so if you let's let's take um yeah good question so let's take um march i'm just going to stop sharing the screen um for a second but let's just take um march this year as an example um and i'm just going to pull up some numbers because i haven't pulled this off the top of my don't know the numbers off the top of my head. Yeah, yeah. Um, I've never seen it. <laughs> Not know a number, but go on. <laughs> exactly. Um, but let's say, so in the month of March, for example, um, equities were down anywhere between 20 to 30% in terms of drawdown, I believe. That was probably one of the worst months since, like for a while, since the GFC, really. Um, if we look at equities, yeah, so the all odds was down about 21% in March, okay? Um, and obviously, we didn't have this, the Switzer High Yield Fund wasn't up and running um, at the time. But if I look at, you know, some like a, a, a sort of a benchmark or a barometer hmm. um, for that, um, you know, some of our, the other cooler bar strategies that we run, um, we're down one and a half percent in the month of March. Versus, That's a big difference. Versus, yeah, Aussie equities. So much lower volatility. Um, and if you look at the volatility um, on equities, I mean, it depends on what sort of time period we're, we're talking about. But we're typically talking about anywhere between 10% volatility or 20% volatility mm -hmm. as a measure um, of you know, risk. If you look at the portfolios um, for the Switzer High Yield Fund, we're talking about volatility of around one to one and a half percent. So substantially, again, lower vol. But, yeah. you know, the the upside that you capture from equities um, is, you know, you would presume to be higher than in, say, this product. This product shouldn't be compared with equities. It's just a different risk return profile right. at the end of the day. And by the way, equities are subordinated to all the debt holders. So when you invest in equities, you're at the bottom of the capital structure. Mm -hmm. Everyone else gets paid out before you do. So all the securities that the Switzer High Yield Fund invests in, um, including government bonds. Um, so obviously, you know, depends on, you know, your view um, of whether, you know, the Commonwealth government or the state governments will default on their debt. Um, but if you take a look at the non-government holdings, which is mainly bank securities, well, bank senior bondholders, bank subordinated bondholders and bank hybrid bondholders, well, I should say just bank hybrid security holders, um, all get paid out before, you know, shareholders get anything. So just different risk.
Yeah, and so the, the bottom line is this, that we all would love to be in 5% government guaranteed term deposits, but they don't exist anymore. So what we've tried to do is go up, up the, the risk curve, but try and keep it as safe as we can. Exactly, exactly. Great, Ying Yi, thanks for joining us in the program. Thank you, Peter. Okay, so if you have any questions, please contact us by phone uh, or email at invest at switzer.com.au. The phone number is 1300 052 054. And a reminder, please read the PDS carefully before investing. Thanks for joining us.